Greetings, mobile accomplishers. Welcome to the Verge Mobile Show. It is the week of November 11th, 2013. Today is 11, 12, 13, uh, which means that we're all doomed. There's a comet in the sky, and uh, it, it's going to spell the end of humanity. I am Dieter Bone. I'm Dan Seifert. I'm Chris Sigler. And I am Evan Rogers. Evan. Welcome back to the show. We're so pleased to have you here. I think that our I think that our last mobile show with Evan was not just a fine mobile show, but the finest ever. And I'm sure that our, our listeners and viewers would agree. So we're all very, very excited to have him back. Now, Some of you a, may was know. Was this a function of Evan's presence or my absence? Uh, I think it was a function of both. Okay. <laughs> Well, for, for those of you who, who don't know, Evan usually serves the role um, of producer for the Verge Mobile show. So he's, he's actually, he hasn't relinquished those duties this week. So I'm, I'm curious to see whether he's able to multitask and still run the show while being on the show. Listen, uh, you know, things are going to happen in the background. Just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain and in front of the curtain. It'll be okay. All right, we'll so these these new hangout thumbnails are not okay. Like, you don't like I don't them? Know. I mean, nice. is this are people watching the live show seeing what I'm seeing? Like my eyes hovering above Chris's head, just like creepily, or are they looking at me ducking down for no good reason? Like, what does this look? <laughs> They're like They're looking at you ducking down to the rest of the world. Really? Okay. Yes. All I see is like my mouth is gone where I'm speaking. Chris's head is, and it's it's very creepy. Um. It's so super, if uh, if I look up, it's like I'm I'm looking up at the giant head above me. Um. Well, yeah. As long as you're not talking, then yes. So, uh, yeah. So okay, what do we got for uh, for stuff to talk about? We've got uh, Moto Maker. Moto Maker is available for everybody in the world in the U.S., not in the world. And yeah, it's now people in the world wish everywhere. it was it was everywhere in the world. I don't know if anyone on this program can do a good Vlad. Like um, imitation, but uh, I, I bet Ellis Hamburger would it does a good blast. <laughs> but but anyway, uh, if he were here, it. if he were here, he would uh, complain that it's still not. It's, as far as I know, it's still not in the UK, right? No, it is not. It's only available in the US and Canada, I guess. It's tragic. But yeah, is great. Think people I, are still excited. Like after I, this, look, this exclusivity agreement is ended. Look, you know, I've I've used uh, a Moto X pretty consistently over the past few days now, and um, I was reminded of just how great of a phone it is. Like, I, I would I would not hesitate to recommend it to pretty much anyone looking for a new Android phone, and I I, I think I would recommend it over a Nexus Five. I've been, you know, I just briefly touched Nexus Five when I was in New York last week, but um, it, it's just an awesome phone. Like, it's the perfect size. Software is great. Um, the camera improvements really helped. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's awesome. And the, the the configurator just makes it that much better. I know that some folks, Dan, I think you included, are waiting for wood. Yes. I, and I don't blame you. Bit of a double entendre. Um, but so can I ask about this? Can I ask about the camera update? Because, Dieter, you've also, you've also had the Moto X and gotten the update. That's right. Is it, like, a real improvement? Like, It is a real improvement, um, but, I mean... Uh, a three is better than a two. I don't know. Actually, I have no idea what we scored the camera. Uh, it's it the and also it's better than that because the Moto X camera is, I think, demonstrably better than the Nexus Five camera. Which again, we're in the realm of like, not saying that much. <laughs> um, but uh, it's better. It handles uh, low light slightly better, and it's just less noisy. Uh, but it can't handle genuine low light nearly as well as an iPhone 5S, or of course, if you want to go crazy at 920 or a 1020, you know, it, it it can't do Lumia style stuff. But um, as long as you're not in the dark or in twilight, uh, it's great. Uh, it's pretty great. I mean, I can. I did this last week with the Nexus 5. I took a selfie. I could do it again because that's. I mean, I just while while Dieter does that, you know, there's uh, all those things that Chris mentioned are great, and then also, you know, the price dropped to a hundred bucks on contract across all four right. carriers. So uh, it kind of makes the Moto X pretty enticing proposition for anybody that is 
shopping for a new Android phone. And just to echo what Chris said, uh, you know, I'd recommend it for the average person over the Nexus 5 pretty much any day of the week. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the, f- the way that the average people in, in America, in the U.S. or whatever, uh, still buy their smartphones. Very few people are buying unlocked phones and using them off contract, mostly because AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, they don't give you a discount to do that. So there's really very little incentive, unless you're a T-Mobile customer, to pay for a phone off contract and then uh, use it on your plan. So for most people, if you are eligible for an upgrade on your respective carrier, you know, 100 bucks for a Moto X is more attractive than 350 bucks for a Nexus 5. Well, the incentive is is um, the latest version of Android, but I just don't think very many people hold that in you know that high of a regard. Right. To Again, the average thing, person, like you know, extra dollars or 150 right. extra dollars. Yeah, for the average person, it's just it's not worth it. And you know, the Moto X is a nicer size. It's you know plenty fast enough. The camera, as we mentioned, is better. Uh, the actual Motor- Motorola software enhancements are actually genuinely usable. So, so. The screen is way better on the Nexus 5, and There's it's also that. larger, but it, it, I also think that, I know that a bunch of people are down on the Nexus 5 hardware, but I think that it um, actually feels a little bit better than the Moto X. The Moto X is more like, I don't know, comfortable in your hand, it's got a curved back, but the Nexus 5 feels a little bit more premium to me, just a little. Um, and I'm willing to believe that they can fix the camera uh, to have the shutter speed not be 4.2 seconds on the Nexus 5. Um, which would be pretty amazing. Uh, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's the that's, that's the biggest software. problem with the Nexus Five is is it takes forever to focus and and snap the picture and then it yeah. it misses focus so often. If you're taking a picture of something that's like still and not moving, then it can take a great photo. So a lot of that does have to do with software. So hopefully, you know. Yeah, people have been sending me uh, XDA developer links to people that are trying to hack the the software to have it you know to change with like the low level settings to make make it better. Uh, I am not rooting my Nexus 5 anytime soon. Uh, I've, not even rooting it? Dude, I've been doing enough of that lately. <laughs> I did it on... I, I completely bricked my 1X. I mean, hard. Um, and uh, I, I did it to my 1, and, like, I just need a break, man. Too much, too much rooting. Too much effort. Well, because I rooted... I actually have a version of Android 4.4 <laughs> 4 on my one somewhere. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I hear you, Dieter. So actually, so, speaking of rooting, Cyanogen Mod OS is now, they've got a one-click installer, apparently, on Google yeah, Play. Uh, apparently. Uh, it's finally here. They've been, they've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now, like uh, almost a month, haven't they? Yeah, well, I think I think it still needs to be paired with the Windows app that they launched or announced earlier on, um, but this uh, Android app that you can download from the Play Store, I guess, makes it uh, that much easier. Um, which is cool. I mean, if you're into rooting and modding your phone, it's never been easier to install a custom ROM if you have a supported device. So, so how do you I haven't feel tried about this. Calling it Cyanogen Mod OS. That's what it's you called. You know, Cyanogen Mod OS. That makes sense to me. Uh, we've talked about this last week, how the Nexus 5 doesn't have... We don't think... I mean, like, there's always been that talk of, like, stock Android and AOSP and, you know, bare-bones Android or whatever. But, you know, we when you look at the Nexus 5, it's not stock Android. It's Yeah, but if I asked Google's you what OS, OS the Nexus 5 ran, what would you say? I would say it runs Android, but if you yeah, ask me if what I OS... If what the S4 runs, what would you say? I would say it runs Android. Okay, but, so... I, I guess I see your point, but you know, I don't know. Cyanogen is more of a more than just a skin. Yeah, well, that's true. It is more than just a skin. There's a lot of customiz- custom customizability in Cyanogen Mod, and um, whether or not that really warrants an OS moniker is kind of. I feel like probably not, but it sounds cool, and you know. <laughs> It's the dev- well, it, it's the dev- I mean, it, it's it's worthy. I mean, it's a it's a flavor of Linux, right? It, like, it's worthy of the OS label, just as the, just the same as uh, Ubuntu or Red Hat or. Well, but I would say I would argue uh, just to you know uh, argue against my own point. I would argue that it's no more of a customization than TouchWiz is 
that Samsung does, and, and Samsung doesn't call it TouchWiz OS on its devices. Well, I don't think Samsung has used the TouchWiz label in right. two yeah, or three doesn't, versions. Doesn't they, I mean, it's just yeah, it's just the Samsung experience now, or you know, whatever. Just the Wiz, <laughs> the Wiz, an operating system, really. I mean, truly. <laughs> I mean, it it's is good. running on Android. Does run on top of Linux, so, and then on top of that, you've got Dalvik, or now for crazy people, the whatever the heck it's called, uh, which actually uh, I want to get into that. Art. Um, the yeah. ART, yeah. ART. But before we get into ART, and it's super good that you're good for ART here, Evan, I interrupted you before. You said you hadn't tried this, but you were about to say something else about CyanogenMod. Yeah, no, I have not tried this one-click installer. Uh, I'm kind of curious about how CyanogenMod is going to posture uh, like bundling exploits for phones, because they're definitely not going to get permission right. to uh, bootload or unlock phones, uh, especially from the phone itself. Um, and, I, like I said, I have not used this one-click installer, but if they're actually including exploits with the APK in the Google Play Store, I'm pretty sure that violates the terms of service, like, hands down. Well, that, that might be one reason why it requires the Windows installer. Yeah, okay. I think that's probably the story. Well, there have been, I mean, been by, using... by the same token, there have been uh, apps that require root in the Play Store for ages, right? Right, but oh, they don't yes, actually absolutely. root the phone for it. Right. No, but they like they take. I mean, they require Actually, there an exploit. Actually, there is a long to... history of Google Play root exploits, but uh, they get taken down pretty fast. Right. Do you guys remember when it was possible to jailbreak an iPhone by visiting a website? That was. Oh, it was like jailbreak.us or something. <laughs> <laughs> those are the days. But. Uh... I've actually been using the latest um, snapshot of CyanogenMod Mod on a G2. And uh, shout out to Dan Rosenberg for being the most elite hacker ever for creating the Loki exploit. But um, kind of playing with this G2 hardware without the crime against humanity that is LG's skin kind of makes me think of what, you know, the Nexus 5 could have been if it weren't cut down for price reasons. And you know, but, but Evan, you know what you can't uh, exploit are the back buttons. There's no oh. way to hack around <laughs> you can't, the back button. You can't, you can't get rid of those. Um, but no, but, wait, you, but you, does, does it have double tap hardware awake? platforms? Yeah, does it have knock-on? That's the big question. That it does still have knock-on. Yeah, so there you go. He got around those, uh, those back button issues. The, uh, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have knock-off, though, so it's totally half-baked. Um, but Wait, is knock-off a real thing? Yes. Uh, is it? I don't even remember. Uh, I'm not sure what the official title of that feature is. What does that mean? How do you double tap the screen to turn it off? That, that's I, 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 don't, I don't think that is an actual feature. I could be high, and I could be wrong, it's and I don't absolutely, need to anymore. It's you double tap to turn it on, and you shave in a haircut to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but using Cyanogen mod and uh, the KitKat like, apps on this G2 actually makes me feel really good about the Nexus 5. I think they made exactly the right compromises um, to achieve the price point they wanted because, like, the difference between the two and even the difference between the cameras, and I have used the camera a lot in the stock firmware, it's very negligible. Like, what? You I don't think there's, I don't whoa, think there's whoa, any... Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call your bluff there. The G2's camera is way way better than the Nexus 5's camera. It's Not, way faster, no. focuses faster, takes better pictures, it's a higher resolution for starters, but, you know, it's like okay. it's like night and day between those. Actually, so I'll, hey, I'll hang see on, your... did you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? It, it was a shutter click. I hit the shutter button on the Nexus 5 before the podcast started, and it just now <laughs> took the picture. <laughs> You know, Listen, Evan, Dan, you, like, you mentioned the, that they, they made those compromises to hit that price point. And, you know, that's great if they wanted to hit that price point, which they clearly did. But, you know, I would much rather have, if they want to do that to hit that price point, by all means, go ahead and do that. But also give me a $500 or $550 Nexus phone that doesn't make those compromises, because I would much rather buy that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, really don't think that the cameras have that much difference. I mean, maybe for a connoisseur who can, who's, you know, used every phone and has seen nice. every camera well, phone Well, Evan, app, Evan you probably remember, we talked about this on the Vergecast last week. Um, Neil I brought up the point that um, he doesn't think, as far as he knows, that the sensors in most of these cameras, including the, the Nexus phones, 
are the same. It's it's that it's all done in software, and Google isn't putting any time or effort into making the camera software in the Google experience, formerly known as stock Android, any good. No, I believe um, that a hundred percent because the stock app gives me unending focus problems. But just playing around in camera FV5, uh, which is just one of my apps that I like for taking pictures, like it locks the focus a lot better. And I'm not sure if it just continues to focus until it does actually autofocus confirm or whether or not um, it actually can communicate better with that library file. The second is a little harder to believe, but the software definitely makes a difference. I'm getting way more uh, good to pretty awesome shots out of FE5, and I have terrible problems with um, the stock app. So software makes a difference, and the firmware makes a huge difference, but it's harder to extrapolate the differences between those. Yeah. Uh, Focal hasn't... I haven't been able to get Focal running on the Nexus 5 at all. Uh, if there are other good camera apps that I could try on the Nexus 5 to help alleviate it, uh, I would totally do it. Uh, but it needs to talk to the firmware properly. You know where there aren't any app compatibility problems is yeah. on the iPhone. That's right. Uh, and and also, you know where I consistently get some of the most amazing pictures I've ever taken with any camera, period? The 5S. Yeah. I'm just putting that out there. It's, you're not wrong. Yeah, you're definitely not wrong. But, um the 5S is a $750 phone. Yes. Can we talk you're, about you're... just cameras in terms of, like, uh, how much they matter to the consumer? Because we've seen a lot of um, discussion on whether or not, you know, having a slightly subpar camera, like, really ruins the Nexus 5, like, whether or not it actually ruins the overall product. I think it matters hugely. I think, you know, when you look at... Uh, Flickr, the number one camera on, not camera phone, the number one camera on Flickr, actually like the top three cameras on Flickr are iPhones. Uh, you know, everybody takes photos with their smartphones and they take a lot of photos with their smartphones. Uh, anecdotally, uh, I've tried to give my wife phones that are not made by Apple time and time again and every single time they last a week and then she hands it back to me and wants her iPhone back because the picture quality and the speed is not... Uh, up to par and not what she's used to. Do you so. hide the iPhone in the meantime so she can't get it? <laughs> it? <laughs> and then she hides the Oreos and then they don't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, Actually, you know... She, she replaces all of the Oreos with candy corn Oreos. With, no, with Hydroxids. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. That Actually, would be that would be Hydroxids are way better than Oreos. We've had oh, them. snap. I'm done. <laughs> Uh, I, look, I totally agree. Like, uh, I, I would love, in my dream world, Google would have pricing tiers for its unlocked uh, direct-to-market phones. It, there would be, you know, a low end, a medium range, and the Nexus line, pro as it stands today, probably qualifies as the medium range. And then they would have a, you know, just absolute no co uh, compromise high end experience that would slide in above the Nexus Five, and it would be best in class camera, but you know, best in class. Well, I guess everything else kind of is already a best in class. You could make an argument for for uh, more premium materials, but the plastic that's on the Nexus is pretty good. Um, if you get the black one, the white one, the white one has terrible plastic. It's does it? Terrible. Yeah, it's, it's just not, glossy, it's not hardcore plastic. It's just plastic, plastic. <laughs> it's got these. It's got this glossy. Uh, nah, you can see you can see my fingerprints on it in a webcam. Let's just put it that way. It feels bad, man. But the black one feels nice. Well, just it, it makes you wonder if, the, you know, at this point in the Nexus's existence, if Google isn't very deliberately making room for Motorola to own a number of market segments that Nexus itself is not intended to. You know, because <clears throat> clearly Google could, if it wanted to, make a high-end you know, no comp uh, compromise Nexus. They could devote the, the resources that are needed to making better camera software, uh, use better materials, et cetera, et cetera. They're not, uh, and maybe that's because they want Motorola to own those markets instead of cannibalizing their own sales. Sounds like a recipe for a modular phone design to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> I forgot about RL already. What does that say about RL? Wow. That's, I mean, you know, it's been... A week, two weeks, I guess, since they unveiled it. Yeah, it'll be a long time before we see anything. It'll yeah, it's all concepts right now. Buy anything? Yeah, it's all um, dreams. 
Okay, so we brought up, um, we were joking about uh, CyanogenMod OS, and then we made the joke about what is an OS. And then, so there's Linux, and then there's Android running on Linux, and then the apps are run with this thing called Dalvik, which basically, like, looks a lot like Java, but it isn't Java, and so Google didn't get sued uh, completely into the ground over it. Uh, but now there's a new thing that is the app engine called the Android Runtime. Is this, if I got this right? Yes. Is that summary right? What is uh, the Android Runtime? Why do I care? Why is why can't I just like stick with Dalvik? Like it's a thing that a developer can turn on and apparently it breaks things, but it's the way of apps going forward. Why are they changing it? Somebody know? So my understanding okay. is that uh, it's two, it's kind of two different ways to to um, to do the actual compiling of the app. So the way I understand it, and um, this is all pretty low-level stuff, um, but Dalvik uses a just-in-time compiler to compile a lot of the uh, Android code on the fly, and uh, you know that works great. It works great on a um, you know quad-core device at like 2.2 gigahertz. But the way ART works. Um, is that more of that code is actually compiled at the installation of the app, and a significantly more or a marginally increased portion is actually uh, compiled to native code at the introduction of the app. So it's two different styles, and uh, there's been a lot of research on uh, Reddit and XDA developers on whether one actually yields higher performance than the other. And mm -hmm. from everything that I've seen, it's kind of a wash because, like, in some situations and for some types of apps, ART works uh, works really well and provides like better performance and lower power usage at those performance levels. And some applications just just work differently and just have been pretty well tuned for the Dalvik engine. So for right we, now, it seems like a wash. Well, you can you can understand, and I don't know if the if XDA research bears this out or not, but it stands to reason that things like you know, ultra high performance games would do better, more you know, with as much uh, pre-compiling as possible. Pre-compiling isn't the right term. Being a computer scientist, I know for a fact that pre-compiling is not the right term. But compiling <laughs> before uh, it reaches uh, the JIT compiler makes more sense for for right. something like a game, right? Whereas, I mean, I, I guess other kinds of apps, it doesn't necessarily matter, but. I mean, at, at this point, it's still really early on. You have to go into developer settings. You have to enable it. It's not enabled by default. Uh, very few people know it exists or know that it's there. And frankly, unless a developer has uh, a Nexus 5, they don't even have access to it yet. Um, right. So. And Google doesn't actually want anybody to, like, really genuinely make production apps with this. It's just, like, a thing they're trying out for them. Right. You know, I think, I think that uh, Google made a big big th to do about how KitKat is going to be running on less uh, or uh, lower end hardware, less powerful stuff uh, and you know ART might be the thing that enables that if it allows the processor to do less work at the time that the the, the app is launching or running um, then you know it's, it's better all around. I'm just not surprised that we're not seeing uh, huge performance gains right now. Apps haven't really been optimized to use it the the feature itself probably isn't fully baked and fully complete yet. So, but. well, uh, it's not. Uh, the way I understand it is that the the actual compiling happens at the installation of the app. So, like, I don't think there's a huge possibility for runtime performance gains. But I do think that you know a lot of people complain about the stutteriness and lagginess of Android, and you know as someone who uses Android all the time and iOS, like, it's definitely there. It's not made up. Uh, but if you're compiling lots of portions of the code at runtime, um, very, you know, as the pieces become available, uh, you know, some of those are going to lag behind others. But if a lot of the code is, you know, natively compiled and doesn't need to be compiled again or compiled at runtime, then a little, like, as those resources become available, it should be a lot smoother. So... I don't know about lower end devices, but uh, hopefully this this could yield some um, some smoothness gains that would be well received. Thank you. Now I understand, but the gist is I don't. Not know now. <laughs> okay. Ain't happening now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess so. Like Moto G is coming. We've seen rumors. I think last night, Wall Street Journal. 
teased or like leaked something. They 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 said it was going to be cheap. Um, what else have we seen about this? They they've teased. Well, they they said it's going to be under two hundred and fifty bucks, right? Yeah, that's what they that's what um, Wall Street Journal said. Um, no, there was a retail promotion card that leaked that had specs on it. And we've seen um, pictures of it, right? Yeah. It looks just like a Moto X. Yeah. Like, just like a Moto X. I'm looking at our pictures now, and yeah, I mean... I mean, the, the concept of making two identical phones in your lineup that are at different price points is pretty novel. Like, the closest, uh, like, analog I can think of is the Galaxy Note and the Galaxy Mega. But it, it's, okay. like, it's, pretty, it's pretty rare for OEMs to, like, do this, right? Yeah, to not make the cheaper one like look cheap. <laughs> so I mean, the only the only thing I can think of is is Apple with the iPhone four, the four S, uh, and, and then I, I guess, guess the five S and the five C. But the, the, I mean, I mean even those looked. I mean, based on what we've seen of the Moto G versus the Moto X, the five S and the five C look further apart uh, aesthetically than the G and the X. And also, yeah. the five C is still very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. So, yeah. Okay, they're announcing it tomorrow as we record this. Um, so I guess we'll find out more. In Brazil, know, right? Yeah. In Rio. So is this supposed to come? I think it's Sao Paulo. Oh, Sao Paulo. I mean, well, who knows? Okay. If everything pans Certainly out with the cost, play. if 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 you know uh, um, the Wall Street Journal's predictions are correct, and this is going to be a phone that's going to sell for under two hundred and fifty dollars, I don't think the U.S. is the market that. Motorola will be targeting with it. It is the emerging markets. It is Latin America. It is Asia. It is Europe. It is the, all the areas where smartphone penetration isn't over 50%. Uh, right. And there's a lot of people that have not upgraded from a feature phone just because of the sheer cost of ownership. Um, and, you know, uh, Nokia has been in that market for a long time, and they've had their Asha lines and things like that. Uh, and then there's, of course, the Chinese companies that have built Android phones in the past couple of years that have entered that market. Um, but, you know, they, all these phone companies talk about the next billion users or whatever, and I think that, you know, if, if this thing turns out to be the price that it's been predicted at and it's got the features that it's predicted to have, then, you know, that's Motorola's play for the next billion users. I can't wait to not hear about the next billion users anymore. <laughs> I, I well, swear I've been hearing that? about it for five years now. It's it's. I just yeah. want everybody to have be given a smartphone at birth, um, and then we'll. All I mean, I I, I suppose the next billion users is a little uh a bit a little bit of a reach. Um, it's probably like the next five hundred thousand users because. It, in that same Wall Street Journal article, they said only about 500,000 Moto X's have been sold. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, they were quoting, like, strategy analytics or something, weren't they? Yeah, I think they, they were recording some, some research. But, it, I mean, it's kind of been apparent that the Moto X uh, well, the has price, not exactly sold well, but the, yeah, price, the price has now dropped. dropped. It's to 99, like, broader quick, availability. And then everybody else moved, moved along to 99. Yeah, but, you know, broader availability of Moto Maker, the price drop, maybe it will get a little kick in the pants before the holidays. Actually, the holidays. answer me this. Other than the original Droid, maybe the Galaxy S3, has there been a phone that is, like, alternative to the iPhone for real in a marketing campaign that hinted at that, that actually, like really took off. I mean, uh, the Galaxy S3, I mean, it wasn't directly marketed in that way, but it, that's what it worked out to be. And you know, I mean, it, what do you mean? It totally popular. was. It was totally yeah, marketed again, as know. being the iPhone. The, well, all of Samsung's ads about the people lining up in front yeah. of the Apple store, and they couldn't do all the cool things the at the same thing is here. I know, but like, there's, it, it, they were, were they hyping it, or were they just like selling the phone like straight up? Like, I'm talking about like the, the Droid launch, like hype. Like, everybody knew the Galaxy S3 was coming. We all knew what it was going to be, uh, and it was fine, and it was great. But there wasn't, like, here's the phone that's going to remake this company. The Droid did that. Um, Palm tried to do that. It didn't do so hot. Uh, Moto X has tried to do that. Lots of Lumias have tried to do that now. It seems like every time we see a phone that's like, this is a big last great hope for this company to take on the iPhone, it doesn't do so well. With Samsung, it was like, yeah, it's Samsung. They're going to sell a ton. 
Well, that wasn't proven before the Galaxy S3. I mean, they sold a lot yeah, of Galaxy S2s. The Galaxy S2, Galaxy S2 point. stuff did really well. Did the Galaxy S2 did well, but it didn't do iPhone well. Like, yeah. and Samsung didn't run with Apple at being the top smartphone maker in the world until the Galaxy S3 and then the Galaxy S4. Um, so, What's the Galaxy S4 doing? Uh, honestly, I'm not up to speed on the latest numbers, but I'm sure it's selling hand over. How's the Galaxy S4 doing? Is that what you yeah. asked? Uh, I'm sure they've sold 11 trillion of them. <laughs> 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 I see them on the streets now. It took a while, but uh, I see them out. Oh, they are um, everywhere. It takes a minute to recognize it, though, from the GS3. From yeah. The I still see a lot of GS3s, but I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the GS3 is still being sold, and it's like 50 bucks or 100 bucks when you sign a contract now. So. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, Samsung totally, Samsung totally bought into the Apple playbook of selling last year's model at a, at a discount. Yeah. I'm sure they'll do the same thing with the S4. So, speaking of trying to recognize the Galaxy S4 from a distance, um, I haven't had this actually happen, but how often are you riding public transit and you're staring at somebody's phone and then they think that you're staring at them and then you're like, oh, no, no, I'm just looking at your phone. and like you're, and, But you actually are, but then you're a creeper. Like I, Every time I see a smartphone in public, every time I'm like making sure I can identify it, and uh, especially with the Samsung phones, it takes a second. And like, I'm becoming that guy on the subway that like is kind of staring. I don't want to see what's on your phone. I don't care that you're playing Candy Crush Saga. I just want to know what phone you're playing it on. So let me just say that a this is what this is me 100% of the time okay. when I take public transit. <laughs> and b my favorite game is to play which which imported Sony is that. Because it is oh. it is it is a hard one. How many imported Sonys are you seeing at this subway, <laughs> Evan? Are you kidding me? Are you even kidding me? There are so many. First of all, Sony sells so many cool phones overseas. We get nothing. It is so dry here for Sony phones. Come on, guys. But also, they sell lots of phones at lower price points overseas, and they just kind of they just get in here. Also, I like Sony phones a lot, even the even the lower end <laughs> ones. So that's why I noticed for sure. But I see them all the time. I'm looking for them, but I see them all the time. Back to Dieter's point. Uh, yeah, I do the exact same thing. I think what it is is, like, I've gotten really used to doing the, like, the quick look and then the look away. It, this is, like, so... These are, like, creeper <laughs> tactics. One on one. But, like... <laughs> right, let's talk about creeping on the subway. <laughs> it's like you just, I, you just kind of look by a few times. And... No, I, I, I do it, too, but because I look homeless, the, the additional danger <laughs> is that is that everyone thinks that I'm about to steal their phone. So I, I, I need to, to say, no, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm not about to grab your phone out of your hand. I'm just wondering what phone you're using. I mean, I'll, I have people, like, straight up ask me. Like, there was this one guy that saw that I had the HTC One before it was actually released in the U.S. It had been released in Europe. And, uh, man, he was like, how did you get that? Let me look at it. I was like, whoa, there it is. Just... Look at it from over there. Um, but it wasn't so bad. Like, somebody saw the Nexus 5. They asked about the Nexus 5. That was cool. Um, so maybe instead of just, like, oh, what kind of phone is that? I should just ask, what kind of phone is that? And then the thing will be over, and they'll, they'll know I'm not a creeper. The, the difference is when, when some guy asks you what kind of phone it is because it's, like, some unreleased phone, it's, like, a, one, one tech nerd asking another tech nerd, uh -huh. whereas if you just ask the poor lady on the subway, uh, it's, like, a tech nerd asking someone who probably, like... Oh, come on, you don't know care. that. She could be a tech nerd. <laughs> yeah, you're right. She could be. Yeah. Whatever. I, 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 this, this, would, this, this whole plan would involve actually talking to people. And yeah, that is not happening. It's terrifying. Major what you do is, is you just you just uh, subtweet about them and and right. see maybe if they see your tweets. Oh. <laughs> I should just take pictures and tweet them anonymously <laughs> so they don't let them know that I'm doing it. That's exactly what I should do. Yes, yes. Before before Sony's were my jam. Uh, creeping on Lumia owners was my jam because like they look very similar. It's also very hard. What? Oh. I thought you meant Lumias to Sony's, or or do all Lumia owners look the same? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I'm just saying my my old jam was to try and find out which candy colored Lumia people had. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, because that's rare. Actually, uh, 
I can't make this transition work. You know what else is creepy? People talking on the phone on the plane. <laughs> that looks creepy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's seriously going to be the downfall of Western civilization. That, well, that it's it's off. it's it's not going to happen. I think that if if airlines dare to turn this feature on, and I don't think that they will, but if if they do, I think that it'll end up being perceived as a security issue in the FAA or, you know, someone will shut it down. A security issue? Yeah. Guys, I'm sorry. I just got five emails uh, about CES and uh, <laughs> Marissa Mayer is speaking there. Yes. Sorry. What? Yeah. Right. Yes. Mar- Marissa Mayer is delivering the keynote address at this year's CES. No, no, it's, uh, it's Kaz Harai. Nope. Yeah, it is. Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer to deliver a keynote address at 2014 International CES. Well, well I guess, a I guess, keynote or the keynote? Yeah, like the, the traditional big a like Bill Gates one is Kaz Oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is the Tuesday keynote. I'm sorry, I totally derailed this, but I've just got so many CES emails, and that makes me sad. And yeah, sad. CES is coming up so fast. Yes, yeah. but, yes it is. But how I, to return to the phone... The phone on airplanes question, like, how is it any different than a bus? People are on their phones on the bus all the time. Yes. I mean, it's annoying. I, I, it drives me nuts. I can't bus. The difference uh, you, on a bus on a, and a plane is on a bus, you can get up and move to another seat. Or you can get off and get the next bus. I guess that's right. true. Yeah. Or you can Does sit in a pool of urine. You can do that on a bus also. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can do that on a plane as well, but... <laughs> Much more difficult to negotiate. Not, not as common. I'm just saying. <laughs> I personally don't think it would bother me that much, but I can see how I, being I'll in tell a you, low space. As somebody who takes problem. who takes a commuter train uh, pretty often, when there's somebody who's gabbing on the phone, it gets to the point where I will get up and move to a different part of the train. And like on a, on a plane, you can't do that. Why don't you just uh, go to a quiet car? There's only like ever one quiet car, and it's like packed. Mm. So there should be a, a quiet car on the plane. <laughs> I believe that's called first class. Yeah. <laughs> so how much? How much do you think a text on a plane is going to cost? Uh, probably it's like a dollar or something. I bet you it's a buck fifty. Easy, buck fifty. It, easy. It sounds about right. That's so stupid. Wait, her, it's her text. It's Wi-Fi. Yeah. Just. They just can't. They just can't price it at that. People would go insane getting like four hundred dollar texting. Calls. I don't know, Evan. They have no problems charging you twenty two dollars for an hour and a half of Wi Fi access that probably won't work. Yes, well, that's true. I mean, what do you think a text costs when you travel to Europe? It's pretty. Expensive. Uh, I think it costs twenty five cents per text message to receive. I yeah. still have that guide up. Well, speaking of. Uh... I'm going to completely derail the conversation Good. now. But um, but speaking of traveling to Europe, so I, I've been testing, uh, you know, Republic Wireless is releasing the Moto X this week, uh, which is what I've been I've been testing the past few days. I'm going to write something up on it. But um, uh, the, the most compelling uh, use case, I think, for the service for, um, for someone who already has, like, another, like, main line is you, you buy the $5 a month, Wi-Fi only service, and then that's your Europe phone, uh, because you you know you can connect to any Wi-Fi hotspot, and you have you just use it like a phone, and you get unlimited texting, and it's five bucks, like it's it's a no-brainer. Wow, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, and it it works great. I've been um, it, it's weird. Like it, they do some weird voodoo to like make the the connections for the phone calls, and somehow it's actually faster to connect to somebody using Republic Wireless than it is with a, a regular phone. Like, if I dial a number and I'm on Wi-Fi, the second I hit send, it's ringing. Okay. It's, it's really weird. It's kind of creepy. Um, but I, it would be a perfect Europe phone, a perfect travel device. And if you're, if you're using a Republic Wireless phone as your main phone, if you get the, the what is it, the $10 plan, which adds cellular in the U.S., then boom, like you know, you just take it over there. You can't. You they don't have any cellular agreements for roaming in Europe, but um, any Wi-Fi hotspot, you got your your regular phone number. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Five dollars yeah. oh, Wi-Fi phone. Is it, isn't is Republic CDMA or GSM? CDMA. 
Yeah, so the, I mean, even if yeah, there's you can't roam at all. Well, Europe. does the Moto X have? Do the CDMA models of the Moto X have GSM? I believe that they do not. I don't Doesn't Verizon? I think that Verizon requires that yeah, all of its it was... phones be able to, to, uh, to, to be roam on GSM. Phones now? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh. But, but regardless, I, I mean, Republic might, actually, Re- yeah. Republic doesn't have any roaming agreement, so they like it's irrelevant. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it looks like the well, Sprint it's, model. It's, it's, has, is it irrelevant uh, if you can put a just a foreign SIM in it, and then it then it works? Uh, that's true, but it, the phone is locked to Republic. Ah, yes. Wait, do you do you have the uh, hold on, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with this Moto X. I can't tell. There's so many variants in this, I can't tell which one's are you, actually... Are you using mine, Evan? What? Are you using mine? No. Is that my Moto X? Okay. No. What happened to my Moto X? It's here. Chris has so it's, many Moto Xs, he doesn't even I think know it's where just they went. in the studio, in honestly. completely different states. How can, how can Evan <laughs> have your... Well, I, I gave, Chris just leaves so, them around. He I travels gave, around the country, leaves Moto Xs behind. <laughs> I, I He's gave like the my, Johnny Appleseed of Motorola. They're like, they're like bastard children. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave... 490,000 of Motorola's 500,000 Moto Xs bought by Chris to give away right <laughs> as he wanders the country. Yes. Yes. Like um, Shane. Yes. It's exactly What's his name? Never mind. Continue. Wandering the country, Chris. What's the next... Uh, what's the next? I, I have nothing else to say about Republic. What's the next uh, topic? I, I, I mean... I, I want to know who, who is the... Whatever you feel like at this point. Who is the actual, like, target demographic of Republic Wireless? Like, everything about their technology seems awesome, and the pricing is really, really good. Well, but... Is it reliable enough to have as a main line? Because a lot of these seem like edge cases. Right. Well, so you know, I I had a good sit down with uh, with their CEO last week, um, and you know, one example he gave is if you know you have a parent who doesn't care at all about data or you know any advanced capability for that matter, it makes a great uh, even a landline replacement. You know, you get the, the either the five dollar plan, which is if you're just gonna keep the phone around the house. Or if you know you want to be able to take it with you, the ten dollar plan, um, and they don't restrict you. It's unlimited minutes and texting uh, when you're on the cellular network, and they don't restrict you. Like they don't, you know, throttle you or cut you off if you use it too much on cellular. Even though it, at some point, I'm sure it becomes profit negative for them um, if you do just use it on cellular all the time because they expect you to be on Wi-Fi for the most part. Um, but uh, they've they've said you know they, they launched in beta. What was it like two years ago? I think. Um, using some really crappy LG or something. It was, it was yeah. like Motorola Defies or something like that. They were no, but to... even before that, I remember Paul was testing when they were still by invite only. Um, they, they, he was testing it on, I don't know, some like super low end Android device, and uh, it, it it had some issues then. And they've been working a lot on uh, making it more robust. Uh, and and now one thing you can do now that you didn't used to be able to do is is uh, uh, transition over from Wi-Fi to cellular without hanging up your call, and he claims that it's bulletproof. Like it, it just it works. And one of the reasons it works so well is because of the way they connect the call. You're not <clears throat> you're not holding the call with uh, the the person you're talking to over just a single connection. It there's an intermediary which is them, Republic, and they hold two connections: one from them to the person you're calling, and one to you. So if if your call disconnects they hold other, you reconnect on another network, whether that be Wi-Fi or cellular. Um, so he even gave like the case where like, you know, if you if you're driving through the middle of nowhere and you you could drive through a pocket of no signal, it'll keep the call open for a certain like a few seconds. So if you come back into reception, the call will still be ongoing. Um, but that's how they're able to do, do these really seamless. Wi-Fi to cellular handoffs even better than like UMA, which never worked very well for me. Like if you, never, yeah. you, you may you may work fine on Wi-Fi, but as soon as you like tried to move from uh, from Wi-Fi to cellular, the call would usually drop, or like it would be it would be janky oh, yeah. in some way. Either no it would way. drop. Yeah. No way. T-Mobile's Wi-Fi calling. My my mother actually is super into it because she works in a hospital that is just like impervious to cell signal. Like doesn't yeah. matter which doesn't matter which carrier on, it just cannot penetrate into that building. 
And um, it works really well, like you're saying, if, when you're on a Wi-Fi access point. But that handoff is, like, not... It, it works so poorly, I'm not actually sure that it's there is one. Like, it <laughs> yeah. works... So very few times. So, so yeah, and I mean, it's kind of like it's ca- it's kind of like. Uh, go ahead. Ah, uh, I was gonna burn Dieter, but he that's fine. Yeah, it's kind of like when uh, Minnesota tries to make a play and they they try to hand it off to the running back and the quarterback just drops it. Yeah, See, no, you'd like happen. to make a Lions burn, but you can't because they're the first place in the division. <laughs> oh, guys, sweet Boom. sports jokes. It helps when everybody else in the division uh, is hurt. Um, <laughs> otherwise, the Lions would. You, know, you, you guys have, like, eight quarterbacks. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter how many quarterbacks you hurt. You have, like, look, eight more just waiting to play. Somebody, <laughs> we've got it. look, we're coached by an etymologist, all right? And he looked at the word quarterback, and he's like, oh, well, obviously we need four, so, we have, so we're holding. <laughs> wow. That's that's how it works, right? No. Listen, man. It's not. No? Okay. Denver is, like, seven and one or eight and one. Until they play Kansas City later this year, and then they'll be like it's next week, I think eight yeah. and four. Yeah, nice. they've got they're once playing Kansas City twice. One game. Though. Once we dive into this conversation, there is no way back. <laughs> There's just no way back. Uh, well, no, Dieter was going to say Look, something about Republic, and he was interrupted. Yeah, well, I was I was going to say something about Republic, but first I I, I was going to help us get back by saying that the Detroit Lions are the Tizen of the NFL. <laughs> I, I would love to hear you explain this. I. <laughs> we just. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, nobody cares about them except for a very small select group of people who think that uh, Tyson is incredibly awesome and amazing, uh, but in the end, it fails. And they never win. The people who are excited about oh, wait, that's Tyson the Vikings. Are excited We're about how much Vikings. money it can make them. Yeah. yeah. There, there are no users who are excited for yeah. the Tyson platform. Tizen is a little bit like the Willis Tower, just not as tall as the one in New York. That is, you didn't even try. <laughs> <laughs> that, that isn't even an analogy. You just didn't even bother to like put any effort into it. <laughs> no, I just had to find a way. How do you feel about that, by the way? We'll, we'll oh, and it's also time. changed names multiple times. Yeah, so it true. is a lot like the Willis Tower. Yeah, the Off Willis- forgotten. No. The, the Willis Tower has changed names once, not, not multiple <laughs> times. Okay. So what was it before Tizen? Was it Bada before Tizen? Uh, Migo. Migo. Well, and Bada merged. Migo, Bada merged yeah. with Tizen, but before Bada that it was merged. Migo, and before that it was it was Mimo. Uh, Mimo. Yeah. Oh, but Mimo. but it was also um. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's pronounced Mimo. Uh, uh, but there there was another. What was the other one? Um. The Intel platform, like yeah. Uh, oh God, what was it called? It was. I can't not know. Uh, Chris, how how do you not have the Wikipedia page already open for this? The Intel platform. You mean Moblin? Moblin. Moblin. Yes. Yeah. Moblin. Yes. Wow. Should yes. Just, should just so, be paid attention. Sorry, so, I got another CES email. So <laughs> Mo- Moblin and Migo merged to become Tizen, right? Uh, I think Moblin came into Migo. God, this whole conversation is just a world of hurt. And there was Lima. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's yeah. like horrible, <laughs> pathetic, bad <laughs> concepts and ideas and operating systems that never materialized. And just when oh. they do materialize, they they are like so anti-user that. <laughs> Wait, did, did, according did, to Wikipedia, did, it is a common misconception to say that Tizen is a continuation of Migo. In fact, it built on the Samsung Linux platform reference implementation delivered within Limo or Limo. And okay. Intel bailed. Intel was making Moblin. That got merged into Migo, and then they bailed on Migo to join the Tizen group. Uh, but I think most of the people that were working on Migo just said whatever and started doing Tizen stuff. So and can we talk about what... The, the, the saddest part about all of this is the guys that make... Uh, uh, shoot, I just was going to make an awesome joke and I forgot the, the uh, cute. Guys that make cute apps are still you know, making stuff for all, the, all of these platforms. Uh, you know what uses cute is the Tesla Model S. Um, <laughs> true story. Wow. Uh, so and then it catches on fire. And, and the, the thing... majority of Tegra 4 chipsets are in cars. So That's true. Um, so one go. of the things that, that, that binds uh, Limo and now 
ties in together is the fact that, as we were saying before, users could not possibly care less about them. They are like reference platforms that are designed to appeal to carriers because carriers can do literally whatever they want with them and create like self-branded phones that just have a morass of crapware, carrier-branded uh, crapware on them, which is the exact same market that Firefox uh, OS is targeting. Um, by the way, I'd like to remind everybody that Sprint once committed to uh, releasing a Firefox OS phone in 2014. I wonder if that's still in the cards. Um, oh, I can't wait. But so, so yeah, I mean, like when you say like carriers are literally not going to be able to to say we're selling a Tizen phone because like that doesn't mean anything to users, and like there's no benefit to be able to describe to users that Tizen has. Like there is no benefit. Yeah. I just don't understand with it, you know, especially in develop. I, I, I maybe the conversation is different for emerging markets, but like especially in developing developed markets where you know, either the smartphones are so well known that people know what to look for, they know what they're getting, they have friends that have them, and you know, you can get an Android phone for free on contract, or you can get an iPhone for free on contract. Uh, what is the play for like, like why bother with with Tizen? Or in, even develop, in developed countries, I think there's less than no chance. Um, when you can get Android handsets for free on contract and older iPhones for free on contract, like uh, I think it's just impossible. But for ultra cheap phones that are bought off contract, where those devices are are great, I mean, it all depends on how much margin they want to get and uh, how much branding they want to associate. Right. Because keep in mind, Tyson doesn't have like if if you're if you're listening to this podcast right now and thinking, "Gee, I'm racking my brain. I can't think of what Tyson looks like." That's because it doesn't look like anything. Like yeah. there's there's a reference phone with like a reference UI, but the whole concept of Tyson is that carriers can tear it apart, put whatever skin they want on it, uh, and like I said, load it with crapware and then sell it for, as like you know a, a, a phone that is inherently like guaranteed to, to boost ARPU. It's um, like that. It's like that Verizon tablet that was just announced last week. Yeah, oh, like, that's Verizon like, tablet. This is, this is a direction that Android is going in, and this was the yeah. original dream of Android. It just got staved off for a while because they needed to make it good enough. They've made it good enough, and now Google's going off in its googly direction. The last and screens we'll I've seen of Tizen was like a story in 2012 of them running like HTML5 applications and just demonstrating like how smooth like this like spiraling 3D like render was in HTML5 and since that time I have not seen a single screenshot or like product demo with Tizen. Yeah. And yeah, I it's, can't, it's all framework. It's all framework. I can't think of a single I can't even think of a single news hit about like potential benefits or features for consumers that like you would use as like marketing spin for this like even yeah. You know, just like horse crap features that don't actually exist. I can't even think of anything. Well, if you go back and look, if you if you go back and look at, nonstop. if you go back and, and look at Limo phones, um, which were primarily sold in Japan, uh, but if you if you go back and look at them, uh, there is no UI consistent. There's no meaningful UI consistency to speak of. There's no like, I don't even think there's like a consist. There's like a app market. Um, and you know the story has changed now, you know, because Limo is years and years old. But still, that should give you like a very foreboding preview of what to expect and what not to expect from uh, from Tizen. I think it's going to be it's going to be completely meaningless to the developed market. Yeah. And let us never speak of it again. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> I, um, I agree. All right, should we wrap up? Is there anything else you guys really want to talk about? Oh, you can buy a Z30 on Thursday from Verizon. But here's the rub. Uh, is there something we really want to talk about? Okay. What, 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 what I find like, so hysterical about this is like Verizon is so half-assed on this. Like, th You can't go into a store and buy it. You have to buy it online. Right. Like, they're, they're, they're making it available for sale, but you can only get it online. So They're not even bothering to stock it. Right. That means that they're not bothering to train sales reps on it or anything. Any of that investment that normally goes into a phone launch. Is well, like, like like I said last week, if you have a Z10 and you're thinking to yourself, "Gee, I wish I had a slightly better Z10," boom, your dream phone has arrived. 
<laughs> but if you're in the other 99.997% of the population, please, I beg of you, one human to another, don't buy this phone. Did you guys see the uh, the funnier die Dave Foley last Blackberry yes. employee? <laughs> that was so yeah. good. <laughs> Quality. So, good stuff. <laughs> uh, I guess the big question for Blackberry is like, what happens now? Like, is the Z30 the last phone in the pipeline that they had, or like, what's well, going on? Well, I think on? the next thing that happens is they get their kneecaps broken by the people that loan them a billion dollars. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and then after that. They're they're carved up into little itty bitty pieces and sold off uh, to the highest bidders. Uh, I don't know. Like I I have no idea. There's Will no we precedent. Ever see a new BlackBerry. Yeah. Well, I, I think they're certainly going to try. At least that's the message they're sending. Um. I, I you know I I think that uh, there there is every company searching for emergency funding says. There right. There really is no precedent in the mobile or you know in the consumer electronics industry. For what's happening with BlackBerry right now, so I like there's I don't think there's any like real way to predict how this is gonna end up. But like I, I don't see as as a as a as a non-executive amateur who's observing this situation, I don't understand how they climb out of this. Like I I see no path they can take. I see no path to success for the new CEO. I, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, I certainly what, what, don't. What's know. next I for mean, them is just like. Waiting to uh, waiting for the weekend where they get to party with the mayor of Toronto. That's, <laughs> that's as good as it gets for them now. I think you know. I, I think that two years ago, they had an opportunity, or you know, even eighteen months ago, they had an opportunity to 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 just like, you know, really swallow their pride and go full on Android and and market themselves as being like the secure the secure Android. Like what what Samsung is trying to do with Knox now. If they had just eaten that market 18 months ago, they could have possibly survived as a niche player. Not even a niche player. Like, a, frankly, a pretty big player for enterprises who believe in the BlackBerry name and want the advantage, all the advantages of having access to the Android ecosystem, which you kind of do with BlackBerry OS, but not oh, really. A, a ton of BlackBerry fanatics that are still addicted to BBM, or at least were 18 months ago, would totally have come over to anything Android-branded, you know, BlackBerry. Yeah. And like, they're like, they, I think... BlackBerry feels like they're there uh, now and that they've got, uh, I think it's a Jelly Bean runtime on the Z3 yep. or whatever. Yep, that um, Jelly Bean runtime. But, you know, <laughs> come on, you're not there. Um, no. And, like, but I think they also didn't <laughs> believe that they could get, like, full-on government security clearance for an Android-based device at the time. Uh, when right. They were, like, making the decision between going with Qnix or going to something else. So, right. like... I don't That's know. a tough decision. Yeah, and like they they made the wrong one. Lose you all know, of your government contracts, or in a chance of surviving. You you, me you mentioned Kinex, and the funny thing about it is that that is still that side of the business. They kind of have a Nokia situation going on um, because that side of the business is still actually quite healthy. They license a ton of Kinex to automakers, right. just as Nokia prior to the the is Microsoft it purchase. Kinex? That that yeah. Although I've mispronounced so much stuff on this show, I wouldn't believe me anymore. Um, <laughs> I have. But, I thought for sure it was Kunix, but I'm but. pretty. I'm. I believe it's Kunix, but don't quote me on that. Kunix? If you go back, how do you pronounce a word with no vowels? It's a good as, question. As close yeah. as you can get, I think you just take a stab at it. Um, so you, if you go back prior to the Microsoft purchase of Nokia's handset division, you know, of course they they have or they had the legacy Navtech, the here business, which is still very healthy, in part because of licensing their map data to automakers. So it's some very interesting and surprising parallels between those. So the like, point is, long term, something meaningful is going to happen to the Kinex size, side of the business, regardless of what happens to BlackBerry as a whole. The question is whether they can make it work as a, a single company, or, or if they'll, they will have to get carved up. I don't know. There's, there's a lot to be said for Kunix. Like, uh, it's its architecture is really admirable and its memory management uh, architecture is just like really cool and it was one of the first truly like object oriented uh, operating systems to kind of exist out there and the history is really interesting and the product that's out there right now is actually like pretty cool but it's like it's already over yeah you know um, yeah. Uh, well. 
I'm going to call that. We're ending on the down note again, but that's okay. <laughs> Things are going to get better next week. It's going to be amazing next week. Just you watch. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can and should. If you want to follow me, I'm Backlon. If you want to follow Dan, he is at DC Seifert. You want to follow Evan? Is it Evan R. Rogers? It's just Evan Rogers. Just Evan Rogers. <clears throat> Sorry, why would I get an R in there? Oh, because Rogers starts with an R, so it's Evan Rogers. Yes. Is there a D in Rogers? There's a D in the Rogers. There's a D in the Rogers. Yes. And if you want to follow Chris, go to the Willis Tower, go up to the roof where he is brick by brick trying to make it taller so that (laughs) New York is no longer better than Chicago in his mind. Uh, You can also find him on Twitter. Is that Z Power? Um, We're all at Verge. And um, I promise to be better next week, which means we'll be here too. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take it easy.